Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. I'm Billy. I'm an alcoholic. By the grace of God and Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink since January the 5th of 1990. Welcome, everyone, to uh, State Line. And uh, I want to thank Mike. Mike uh, picked me up last night at like 11.30 from the airport, um, and I just almost gave him a heart attack because um, I don't know what time we got back to the hotel last night, like 1 o'clock or something like that, and um, I was not supposed to be here this morning, so I changed everything, and then... Uh, had to work this morning, so I got up. I'm trying to think. I'm in a, fa- a, fa- a haze. I got up at like 5:30 this morning for the East Coast to deal with work because I was supposed to be at work. Um, and then I went to bed like three hours ago and just gave him a heart attack. But I want to thank him for picking me up. Um, and if you're new, I really want to welcome you. Um, and I really want to stress that you know my experience on step one. Is really that going to be of a chronic teenage alcoholic? And my experience, um, contrary to a lot, what a lot of people think, is that you can be a teenage alcoholic. You can be a 65 year old alcoholic. You can be a 20 year old alcoholic. Um, you can just be an alcoholic. Um, it's just that a lot of what you're told about what is an alcoholic is different than what's in our literature. That's my experience. You know, I tend to support our literature, and I tend to try and stay within the confines of our literature. But I just want to let you know that there are nights that I have dreams where I think, God, I would love to just have a 10-minute discussion with Bill W. And I'd love to know what he was thinking, because I have a suggestion or two regarding the literature um, and where things were placed and what should be in there. And, you know, if I had to rate my top ten suggestions, if my own ego had to rate my top ten suggestions, I would fall on one piece of information that I think is super important. Um, And that is there is a lot of bad information out there about what what makes you an alcoholic and... Not only is step one important for your own life, obviously, but what about the people you run into that are dying of alcoholism? What about the people you run into in the parking lot, in the back of the meeting, on the phone, in a treatment facility, in a correctional facility? And what about if they've never been told what makes them an alcoholic? Or worse than that, what about if they've been told what does make them an alcoholic and has nothing to do with being an alcoholic. And the close relation between the doctor's opinion, step one, and working with others. I'm a person who believes you can take the doctor's opinion and lay it over working with others, and it is basically the same. It is basically almost the exact same advice. Because... As I start to talk about step one, and I love that today was mentioned um, what it is in AA history, Um, I used to say all the time, and obviously the pandemic changed it, but as a young kid who grew up and got sober in New York, a lot of people don't know that, you know, December 11th and 12th every year, a group of people from a group in Mexico always come up to Central Park West and they always go across the street if you've ever been across the street from Towns Hospital at 98th and Central Park West if you do go to New York City I would tell you please go to 98th and Central Park West it might not be Towns Hospital anymore but it is the exact same building and you can look and you know depending on your level of nerdiness with aa history you can have a different experience you know some people just look at the building and they're blown away if you take like an aa archivist there they will decide which window it was that bill felt like he was floating out um and what side of the building um but what's important to know about all of that 
is that if you've seen the good old Al Anon version of Bill's story, which is in all the movies, the most important line that everybody learns, whether they are drunk or sober, or an AA member or not, is Bill in that Brooklyn apartment, and Bill looking at Lois, and Bill being very depressed, and having a really bad day, that up until that day he was the worst 12-stepper in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. That come the spring before he went to Akron, he could not help anybody. And we all know, because most of you, the type of crowd that you are, have seen that movie, and you know that Lois basically said, who cares? She gave the al response. Who cares? You're sober. That's all that matters. And that is a great response if you're an al I don't want to take that away from any al including my mother. I don't want to take that away from any al But if you believe that the steps are our message and the traditions protect our message and the concepts perpetuate our message, then if AA remained the same as it was that day in Brooklyn, none of us would be here. None of us would be here. Bill would have continued to be the most unsuccessful history in an organization that never even started. He would have just stayed sober himself, and him and Lois would have on and lived their life. So there is a part that is not really in the big book, but it's in AA Comes of Age. And it is a seminal moment of step one. It is the most important critical information regarding being an alcoholic. Because before Bill went to Akron, he had that same discussion with Dr. Silkworth. And Dr. Silkworth did not have the same al type response. Dr. Silkworth said, well, Bill, why don't you tell me your approach? And so Bill described his approach. And Dr. Silkworth did not say, well, thank God you're sober. No, he said, no wonder what you're doing is not working. What you're doing is crazy. You cannot tell active, drinking, alcoholics that you were in a hospital room and God came in the window on the third floor and you felt like you were floating on a cloud of air, like with the clouds and the angels. You can't be saying that. They're not going to listen to you. You have to focus on one thing only, the medical estimate of alcoholism. Period. The medical estimate of alcoholism. And when you think about, if you believe in seconds and itches, if you think about what would have happened if that discussion never happened when Bill went to Akron, it's really something that would hurt your brain if you're an alcoholic and your life depends on Alcoholics Anonymous. Because when Bill went to that gatehouse in Akron and met with Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob, in many talks and many places that he's referred to in history, was only supposed to give this guy from New York a couple of minutes but yet that couple of minutes lasted a lot longer. And Bill did what Dr. Silkworth told him to do. He focused on the medical estimate of alcoholism. And the Me Too moment happened. And it's all about what step one, Me Too. It's all about the ability of a sponsor or somebody in AA working with a new person, helping that person get to Me Too the medical estimate of alcoholism, because, you know, I say it all the time, I work with a lot of people at work, um, and when you work with a lot of people and you've worked for a lot of years, you get to know people, and the one thing I've found out about people is everybody has a cross to bear. Every family has somebody like me. Every family, whether it's an uncle, an aunt, father, sister. It might not be alcoholism, but every family has their challenges and everybody has their problems. 
and everybody has an ism of some type. Because we throw that ism around all the time. Almost as if it is a reason to say you're an alcoholic. Because my experience, and my experience with my own life, my mother's life, and talking to others in AA, and others in 12-step fellowships, is everybody has some type of ism. What 90% of them don't have is a physical allergy and a mental obsession. They have all kinds of problems, but they do not have a physical allergy and a mental obsession. And I am an alcoholic who came here as a teenager, and depending on any given day, I could argue... Did people not tell me what an alcoholic was? Was I so arrogant I didn't listen to what an alcoholic was? Did I not run into the right people to tell me what an alcoholic is? But it's funny when I think about it. I have an aunt um, who lived in Staten Island. And I always love when there's, you know, this color big book that doesn't have my leather cover on it. I just love the regular big book. Because my aunt had five boys and one girl and lived in a blue-collar section of Staten Island. And that aunt is the first person who I ever knew was an Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not know what AA was. I did not know what it meant. Um, but I knew from a young age that my dad called that aunt crazy. That I knew that he referred to as crazy aunt so-and-so. Um, and that, I don't know, when I was about the age of eight or nine, my mother, I heard somebody say on the telephone to somebody, and you know, when you're talking about eight or nine in my life on the telephone, you're talking about my mother with a 20-foot cord wrapped around the kitchen hallway into the bathroom with the cord closed between the bathroom door and the wall um, on some kind of rotary phone, but I remember her telling somebody that Aunt, I'm not going to say her name, can't drink. Alcoholics can't drink. Now, I was eight or nine years old. I don't know what I did with that information, but I remember hearing my mother say it which seems to go completely against what I'm watching on TV on the three channels that are available when there's a story about some alcoholic. It seems that the problem with alcoholics is they drink. And um, my dad died of this disease. Um, it's, uh, you know, it blows my mind that... Um, he would never go to Alcoholics Anonymous. To him, AA was for quitters and losers. That's what he believed. I have to honor what he believed. Um, but he was a firsthand expression of this illness to me, and I buried him when I was 10 years sober. You know, but I watched somebody, I watched somebody die of this disease in front of me. I watched a man who was 63 and looked 93 in his casket. I watched a man who was legally blind because he was diabetic and when told that he had a choice to not see or stop drinking, he chose to see if he could do both. He was a person who stubbed his toe while on a trip on a beach and wound up having that toe amputated and was told by a doctor that if he didn't stop drinking with his diabetes, he would have severe medical ramifications. And unfortunately, they just weren't all at once. You know, the kind of alcoholics, the kind of people that we are, you know, he went one toe, two toes, half a foot, below his ankle, below his knee. So he sat in his casket legally blind, half his leg on his left side, looking 30 years older than he was, but definitely not an alcoholic. Definitely not an alcoholic in his eyes. And 
Um, sometimes we focus so much, I think, or I did because I didn't know better. What makes me an alcoholic? Well, I fight with a lot of bouncers. You know, I don't know if it's bouncers have a thing against me. I don't know why that is, but I there must be something to this fighting with bouncers and being an alcoholic. Um, why are you an alcoholic? I don't know. I am not doing well in school. It's not that I actually don't do well in school. It's that I don't make it to school a lot. I have a difficult time actually going there, and then when I go there, I don't go to class. So I've figured out that it's two parts to this school thing. There's actually going, and there's going to class. Or I could tell you, well, I have a lot of DWIs. That makes me an alcoholic. And you could go on and on. Or I could tell you that I, when I go to a sporting event, I get tired of turning around and looking to my right. And I get tired of seeing like 10 guys who are all wearing yellow windbreakers and they're talking to somebody and that person is pointing at me. And then the next thing I know, they're coming to have a discussion with me and I don't get to see the end of the game I'm at or the end of the concert I'm at. Like, I could go on a long rant about how those things might make me an alcoholic, but the truth is, and this is, I think, the part where maybe I've failed the most, is that happens to a lot of people who are not alcoholic. And that's what we need to get across in our individual lives to the newcomer, is that none of that is limited to alcoholics. Bill W. said in 1961 in a talk that doing stupid things is not limited to us. That all people who get drunk do stupid things. It's a byproduct of getting drunk. And the drunker you get, the stupider sometimes those things get. But that's not what makes an al us an alcoholic. And, you know, I don't want to steal anyone else's thunder. But the relation between step one and step two is often not talked about enough. Because when you're talking about a teenage boy or then a boy in his young 20s who comes into Alcoholics Anonymous... What do I want to focus on? Well, I want to combine step one and step two. And not only do I want to tell you what I do, but then I want to tell you how insane I am. Except the only insanity I talk about is all the insane things I do while drinking. And no one told me, oh no, Billy, all alcoholics do stupid things while drinking and insane things while drinking. That has nothing to do with the insanity that we're talking about. It took me till I met Joe and Charlie in 1993 until I really, really realized the insanity that they were talking about. Because for me in my life as a chronic teenage alcoholic, you know, I always, I always say to people, you know, I can tell my story quickly. I have two arrivals. You know, I don't know who this guy Bill W. was. And I didn't read the big book a lot between ages 14 and 23. In fact, if I saw you get out of your car with a big book, I would run away from you. I would know you're one of the, like, AA Taliban. You're like one of these lunatics who brings their own book to a meeting. Who doesn't, you know, you know, I know the meeting has books. I know there are books here. You don't need to show off and get out of your car. And you don't need to bring those highlighters and that dictionary and whatever else kind of ridiculous stuff people like you bring. Um, but... Um, at 12 years old, because I had never read the book, I didn't know that Bill W. had arrived. Later on, I know that Bill W. had arrived. Um, except my story is very different than his. It's why it's critical to go through the big book with someone who's been through the big book. Because identifying and not comparing is so important, and because really being able to look for what makes you an alcoholic Really, if, if you're out there working with alcoholics on a front line, 
knowing every page in this book where you can help a newcomer qualify if they really are an alcoholic, knowing that this is not a book of answers but a book of questions, or as Bob B. says, this is not the treasure, this is the treasure map. This is the map to the treasure, but it is also a book of questions that you can point to people, to a newcomer sitting in front of you. I didn't know that when I was 12 years old. You know, and, and even when I did know that, this guy is Bill W. He's a New Englander. He's a Red Sox fan. He went to a prep school. I'm a, I'm a kid from Irish Catholic New York who went to public school. And, um, but I had arrived. I just didn't know I arrived. See, I arrived in the woods. I arrived because, as I say often, two things make you an alcoholic, the physical allergy and the mental obsession. But as I said this morning, there's a lot of other human tendencies that a lot of us seem to have in common. It doesn't make us an alcoholic, but I sure do run across it a lot. I'll tell you a couple for me. If you tell me not to go somewhere, I have to go there. Okay? Just put that right out there. If you tell me not to hang out with a particular person, I know that person is the most fun person I'm ever going to meet in my life. Those two things right away. Don't go there. I need to go there. Don't hang out with that person. I'm going to love that person. Well, for me, that was the woods and the kids who hung out in the woods. My mother told me, don't hang out in the woods and don't go to the woods. But finally, one of those older kids invited me to the woods. And when I went to the woods, you know, I say it all the time, there were four things there that changed my life. There was a bonfire. I had never been to a bonfire before. There was loud, heavy metal music. There was Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and even some country rock, Molly Hatchet and Pink Floyd. And it's the, we're talking the 70s, so the age of the big, big boom box that only, that always one kid in every group carried around like eight D cell battery boom box, you know? That was in the woods. There were girls in the woods. And I got two eight-packs of the old Miller Pony small bottles, if you remember the Miller Pony bottles. The next day, my life was changed forever. It might not be everybody else's story, but it's mine. If my life never got better than loud music, a bonfire, girls, and alcohol, my life would be great. If I could have that every single day, but I failed to realize what happens to me when I drink. I failed to realize through all this other stuff going on. And I think about, and I often say, I am so grateful to the juvenile court judge I met at age 14. And if you're out there talking to members of your community or talking to treatment centers or counselors or rabbis or priests or the type of people that commonly come into contact with people like us. I don't know who I owe a big thanks to. I wish I could find that man or woman. But you see, when I went and sat in front of a juvenile court judge, somebody who does service had beat me to that judge. See, I had been in front of many school psychologists, many school social workers, many family therapists. The list goes on. But that judge, I don't know if it was a day before, a week before, a month before, or a year before, somebody told that judge, teenagers can be alcoholic. If somebody comes through your courtroom that happens to be like this, you might want to think about asking them to try out Alcoholics Anonymous. And thank God that judge told me that, because no one else had told me that before. And when I look at my drinking, especially between age 12 and 14, and then between 14 and 24, um, I have to talk about the Me Too moment. What makes me an alcoholic? It's not that. I mean... We tell our stories, it would be very easy for me to stay here. Okay, between the ages 14 and 18, when it comes to junior high and high school, I was usually on detention or suspended. 
I just had a hard time with structured education environments. Had a difficult time there. When it came to New York State, I just seemed to always be on probation, juvenile or adult, or going into county for a violation of probation because I just did something else wrong and they want to violate me and I need to get out again so I can get on probation. That's easy to describe my outside life. But sometimes it's easy as a newcomer to deflect people away from you by focusing on what happened to me instead of what happens when I take the first drink. It's very easy to focus on things that I think make me look cool. Fighting is cool. Fighting with bouncers is cooler. You know, all these things that we put up in our head. But the truth is, is that night in the woods, something happened to me that didn't happen to the other kids. You know, there is a saying, I don't want to argue with AA history, but there is a saying out there that says, you know, once a pickle never a cucumber again. That's not my story. I've never been a cucumber. I don't know what it's like to be a cucumber. I've never been a cucumber. I'm not saying there aren't some people in AA who are cucumbers and then become pickles. That's awesome. That's great. But if you read the doctor's opinion and love it like I do, this is my story from the start. This is from Word Go. We believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. I can tell you what, I've written a few notes in my book. We believe and so suggest a few years ago, I believe that the actions of alcohol on me is a manifestation of an allergy. The phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form. Can I safely use alcohol in any form? And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon anything human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve, which is then when we go on to a three-hour workshop about the dash and our lives being unmanageable and how that is separate than being powerless over alcohol. Um, but again, that's the importance of having a sponsor who's been through the big book. There's a lot of stuff we hear in AA every day that if we don't take the time to sit down with the newcomer, it's easy for the newcomer to kind of try to figure out for themselves like when you hear that the first drink gets you drunk. That's hard to digest for an alcoholic like me. I'm not sure whether it's my brain or my ego or a combination of both. But how is that possible? I knew by the time I was a senior in high school that it was the first shot after the eighth beer. Like, I told my school social worker that. I told my school therapist that, like, if I could just not do shots. I've identified in my life that when I do shots, life gets nuts. And that it's kind of like after the eighth Heineken, when I seem to want to do a shot. I didn't know the connection to the first drink. And why is that so important? Well, I'll tell you why, because how many people do you run into sometimes, especially newcomers who I talk to, I love parking lots, I love in-person AA is back because I'm a person who believes miracles happen in the parking lots of AA meetings. I love Zoom and I understand that there's a digital parking lot and whatever else, and I'm not saying for those that love it, it's not great, but I will say this. And I'm sure there are a few people in here who would admit it in their own life. I would, in mine. You can tell me later on if you would admit it in yours. But how many people have left an AA meeting and somebody else in that room noticed that something just didn't look right in them? 
whether they had an hour, a day, a week, a year, a bunch of years. How many people have left an AA meeting in person, minding their own business, walking out to the car, and someone from 10 feet away said, Hey, how you doing? Or, what's up? Or something looks wrong. There's thousands of people in Alcoholics Anonymous whose lives have been saved in parking lots where that simple one-on-one -on -one interaction has led to going through the big book with somebody else. And when you go through the big book and when you sit down and talk to someone new, often they're like me who have never really talked about the physical allergy or the mental obsession. No one's really talked about it. What makes you an alcoholic? Oh, I get arrested a lot. Well, that, believe it or not, doesn't make you an alcoholic. What makes you an alcoholic? Oh, I suffer from the ism. Well, believe it or not, that doesn't make you an alcoholic. What makes me an alcoholic, and looking back at my teenage years, and why I have never been a cucumber, is that once I drink, I have to keep drinking. I have to keep going. My body will not let me stop. And when you look at Dr. Bob and his interaction with Bill in that gatehouse in Akron, what did Dr. Bob say? Boy, this is the first person I've ever talked to who has described what happens to them when they drink is exactly what happens to me. And Dr. Silkworth, and God bless the early members of Akron, it's a collision that occurred. It's a step one collision that occurred in 1935. The solution of the Oxford group collided head on with the problem that Dr. Silkworth identified. Up until that time, the Oxford group knew what the solution was. They just didn't know what the problem really was when it came to alcoholics. Up until that time, the opposite was true of Dr. Silkworth. He knew exactly what the problem was. A physical allergy manifested through a mental obsession, and but he didn't know what the solution was. And there's lots of people out there in the world today telling people, I just want to look up a note I wrote, telling people all kinds of interesting things when it comes to alcoholism, or what makes you an alcoholic. But I'll tell you what Carl Jung said. I don't have to listen to what other people said. Carl Jung said alcoholism is an illness. He said it, he, it crushes its victims by making them feel hopeless. And he also said there is no cure but a spiritual solution. Period. End of sentence. No cure. That's it. And the man who, thank God, interceded with Carl Jung's life, William James, that faithful day in 1910 or 1909, William James had been talking about transformative spiritual experiences. If you've had the patience to read varieties of religious experience, it is a case study of people who've had these transformative spiritual experiences. And what did William James say? These people go through things that involve intense emotion, that there's no will involved at all. And most importantly, it gives the individual the power to accomplish impossible things. That transformative spiritual experiences give the individual the possible to do the impossible. But if you're an alcoholic, if you don't get to the medical estimate of alcoholism, none of this matters. None of it. I sometimes wish in my own life when I would be interviewed by, um, I don't know how it is in the state that you live in, but in the state that I grew up in, if you get arrested again, the probation officer comes and sees you while you're in custody, and then they write a quick little report up to the, sent the judge, and that decides whether they're going to bail you, although I am... You know, when I grew up, there was a lot of cash bail. Um, 
And that report determines whether the judge is going to let you walk out that day and come back to, you know, uh, court. I sometimes wish people would have asked me, what happened? What happened with that first drink today? Because you ask me about my life as a chronic teenage alcoholic, and I'm going to tell you what happened at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to tell you that I was out drinking. I was minding my own business. And it usually goes from there. What I am not going to tell you is this. I woke up around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I reached for my nightstand where hopefully there was at least one cigarette. That's how I like to wake up. I like to wake up around 4 o'clock in the afternoon with at least one cigarette left to the right of me. I like to light that cigarette before my feet touch the floor because by the time I was 15, I figured out that my hangover doesn't feel as bad if I get nicotine in my system before I actually get my feet out of bed. And I like to get to a 7-Eleven, and I like to get a big gulp from my throat that's killing me, or a coffee, and I like to get a new pack of cigarettes, and I like to face the day at like 5.30 p.m. That's when I like to wake up and face the day. You know, um, but I didn't know that when I started to feel uncomfortable in my own skin, that that was my mental obsession. You know, I didn't realize that as I was minding my own business before I even picked up a drink that day, that my brain starts to talk to me and it starts to tell me things that are not true. One of the things it tells me is I don't have the allergy. No matter how many times that allergy has kicked my ass, my brain tells me I don't have the allergy. And because I'm dealing with the consequences of the night before and the week before, I'm uncomfortable in my own skin. And my brain tells me I just need to have one or a couple of drinks. I think sometimes, you know, about my mother and her not being able until she found Al-Anon to understand me, and then she understood me too well. Um, then she realized everything I said was just a lie and um, that she had no control over my alcoholism. But um, it's hard when I think about it that at 17 years old, my only wish in life was that a six-pack was as magical to me as it seemed to be to everyone else. How come everyone else, how come everybody else I know, their life is fine if they just have one six-pack on Saturday night? You know what I've learned today? Those people are fine with like two and a half beers. But I thought it was a six-pack. I just wanted to be one of those people who could have a six-pack. Or what about one of those people who can have like, I don't know, it's your birthday and the bartender makes one tumbler of mudslides and pours one mudslide for each of the six people there. I don't know. Um, or maybe one melon ball. I'm just going to have three, ball, three beers and one melon ball. Or tonight I'm just going to have two beers and one fuzzy navel. Everybody else seems to be able to have just one fuzzy navel. How many times did I tell myself between ages 14 and 23 that I could do that? And I can't do it. I am no different medically and physically than other alcoholics who were born differently. My internal alcoholism was not caused by anything external. And it can't be fixed by anything external. And now I kind of understand why certain people, if I think about it, and I would tell any newcomer, if you think about how tragic your life was before you got sober, and all the people who interceded into your life, 
you will actually be able to come up with one or two or three who are different than the others. I've come up with those one, two, or three. You know why they're different? They knew that a person like me can't drink. They knew what alcoholism was. They knew you could tell me anything and I could tell you anything, but a person like me can't have one drink. So you can put me in a probation office. You can send me to harm reduction school. You can tell me that we're going to try to reduce the harm you call Billy, cause Billy, and, and we're going to try to deal with all these other things like, this is why you shouldn't speed, Billy. This is what happens to people who speed. Or, Billy, this is why you shouldn't do this. But not Billy. Someone like you, you were born differently. You are medically and physically different than your fellows. Only about 10% of the rest of the world has the same problem you do. And that problem is whether you're rich or poor, young or old, gay or straight, black or white, believe in God, don't believe in God, whoever you are, people like you cannot safely drink alcohol at all, period, end of sentence. And I think about that today, and when I think about working with a new person, and I think about being in the parking lot, and I think about asking someone, well, do you think you're an alcoholic? Oh, yeah. Why? I got a lot of DWIs. Do you think you're an alcoholic? Yeah, I lost my kids. You think you're an alcoholic? Yep, lost my job last week. That is like the number one sign for me that that person, whether it's me or not, get my ego out of the way, that person needs to sit down and start at the front of the big book and start with the blank page and go to the forwards and the preface and they need to go through the doctor's opinion. And, you know, I say to people all the time, if you go on a cruise or you're in the world and, you know, the world's an interesting place, but you hear the code word, we all learn code, are you a friend of Bill's? Are you a friend of Bill and Bob's? It's kind of code, we love that code. I really don't care if someone is a friend of Bill's. What's most important for me when I find a newcomer is are they a friend of Fred and Jim's? And if they're not, then my number one job is to introduce them to Fred and Jim. I'm glad you found Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm glad you like all the fellowship in AA. I'm glad you like the late night vaping all night long after the diner. I love that. If I was young today in AA, I'd be vaping all night long too. Who am I kidding? Right? That stuff is all nice. But if no one has taken you to Fred and Jim, is no one has told you the story about having one drink because you wanted to have milk, thought that it inside milk is somehow different, if someone told you that after a long time of not drinking, you can safely drink, I need to introduce you to Fred and Jim. And I need to explain to you what they mean by having an unmanageable life. You know, that I admitted I'm powerless over alcohol. Stop. I am. I have the physical allergy. And that my life is completely unmanageable. And to make sure that the newcomer knows that I sit down with the newcomer and let them see both sides of that equation. I, um, sometimes we hear people say in AA today, well, I drink and then I do something else. Well, okay. But that's not a manifestation of an allergy to alcohol. That might be something else. But the manifestation of the allergy is that you need to keep drinking. Um... I think step one, my personal opinion, if you've personally taken it, is the greatest asset to working with a newcomer 
regarding working with others and letting them see in the doctor's opinion what happened. I did not know, and I'm going to, you know, we mentioned Clancy um, already. Um, I was looking at an old picture of State Line from way, way back, and there was Tom I in that picture. And, um, you know, I remember Tom one time saying to me about the power of one drink, one shot, one rum and coke, one beer, pick your poison. And I remember him explaining to me that the alcoholic ego is such our enemy because just talk to anybody you meet here today who's been in AA for a while, chances are I have a good bet that when you talk to them, you're going to find out that their life is miraculous compared to when they came in. Their life is miraculous. That they've been able to accomplish impossible things. But as Tom would say, the alcoholic ego is your enemy because you can do anything. But you can't take one drink. You're not allowed one single drink. You can become governor. He said, Billy, I became the warden of a maximum correctional facility, and I'm a felon. But I can do that, but I can't have one single drink. Sometimes we go into certain places in AA and we become so rigid, I'm pointing the finger at myself. Sometimes somebody shows us what's in this book and we can't wait to shout it from the rooftop and tell everybody I'm a recovered member of Alcoholics Anonymous now and I need to save you from AA light. You're probably going to AA light. You're probably not going to real AA and I need to rescue you out of the AA you're going to and I need to get you, you know, where. And I mean, we can all, I think, if we're honest, a lot of us have gone through certain things like that. Because one of the things that the ego hurts is we like to say certain things from podiums like this that are a death sentence. Even though we all laugh about them, for the newcomer, they're a death sentence. The number one offender, if there was a top 10 FBI list of things that are dangerous and deadly, said in Alcoholics Anonymous, is alcohol is only mentioned in the first step. There is nothing more deadly to the newcomer than downplaying the deadliness of alcohol. Now, there are a lot of better speakers than me here all weekend, and they will tell you about the benefits of the other 11 steps, and I'm not doubting that for one second. And I'm also not going to doubt that if you don't deal with those other steps, the mental obsession will be in your life every day. I mean, we can cut to the chase on a lot of why we do steps 2 to 12 and why you're supposed to live in 10, 11, and 12. It's to keep the mental obsession away. That the mental obsession is further away when you're living in 10, 11, and 12. But don't tell the newcomer that alcohol is only mentioned in the first step. It's just simply not true. Joe and Charlie would say all the time, all the time, if you work the steps off the wall, you have an off-the-wall program, period. That's their quote, not mine. So when you say alcohol is only mentioned in the first step, you're saying I'm working it off the wall. I've gone to the point now where I'm out of the debating society, I'm following that instruction, and I just go to page 43, I've settled on 43, maybe you could argue we could get to 45 or 47, but... For lack of arguing, I go to 43, and if you start at the beginning in the big book, 
There's some Roman numerals there, so let's just call it 50 pages. That many pages talk about alcohol and identification as an alcoholic. That's not just alcohol is only mentioned in the first step. That might be true, but the first step in the big book is 50% of the first 104 pages in the four, in the hundred and... Let me just explain that. Because everybody loves to debate, right? In so many debates. In the big book I have in front of me, there are 103 pages where step 12 ends on page 103 in this fourth edition. If there's Roman numerals before page 43, let's call it 50 pages. Half is focused on identification. That's how important it is to get the newcomer to the Me Too moment. Think about Dr. Bob and our history. Think about that gatehouse. Think about um, Henrietta Seibling's son was a congressman. I don't, Kent might have talked about it today, but one of the great things he did was he read into the congressional record his mother's experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. He thought her involvement in AA was so important that it should be read into the congressional record. So one day he did that. And when you think about Henrietta Seibling and you think about the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, and you think about, you know, let me throw another speaker at you, Ken D. If those of you who are around remember Ken D, he could talk about our history in a way that was funny and exciting. But the miracle of AA is not that Bill talked to Reverend Tunks. The miracle was always that when Bill called, finally got her on the phone and said that he's a rummy from New York and he's looking for another alcoholic to work with, that she said, I'm ex I've been expecting your call. That's the miracle. She was expecting the call. But why was she expecting it? Because she had been in so many meetings of the Oxford group with Dr. Bob, where she heard him talk about his various adventures, I'll call them, when he drank. And how come Dr. Bob, that one day on Mother's Day 1935, his life changed? Why was it that day? And it's according to his own story because of the Me Too moment. Listen, there's a lot of people who get to AA and we come here in all different shapes and sizes. And I know some of you are different shapes and sizes than me. So let's just take a look at a couple of the things behind me as I end here. There are some of you that came here and couldn't wait to believe in a power greater than yourself or already did. I'm not that shape and size. There are others of you who came here who couldn't wait to do a searching and fearless moral inventory. I'm not that shape and size either. There are a couple of others of you who are entirely ready that you couldn't wait to get rid of all your defects. I'm not that shape and size either. And believe it or not, there's some people who come to AA, they can't wait to make amends. Can't wait. And then we get to the really healthy people who come to AA. They can't wait to have a spiritual awakening. Sometimes we forget who comes into AA. Sometimes we want to treat the person with three days like they have 30 years. What person that lives the way we do when we drink comes in here and says, you know what, that's going to fit perfectly in this life plan I have going on. <laughs> it's going to fit perfectly. My experience is, if the person truly is an alcoholic... Those 12 things are about as opposite as what runs through their natural DNA as possible. As opposite as possible. So why would somebody like us want to do steps 2 through 12? Why would people like us want to do inventory, want to get rid of our defects, want to make a list of people we harmed, 
want to make direct amends and want to live some kind of spiritual life that to me sounds like I'm in a robe in an airport, but why would we want to do that? There's only one reason why people like us will do steps 2 to 12. And that is because you reach the Me Too moment. Because I reached the Me Too moment. Because someone explained the medical estimate of alcoholism to me. Because somebody told me that I suffer from an allergy that will never go away. Because somebody told me that worse than an allergy, I suffer from a mental obsession. And that those two things, I'm not even going to debate twofold first, threefold disease tonight. Um, I think the big book is clear. We have a spiritual solution for a twofold problem. And if, if you're like me, All I wanted was a couple of drinks to feel better. That's it. If you're like me, life sucks. The probation officer sucks. My mother in Al-Anon is a complete nightmare. <laughs> Have you ever lived with someone in Al-Anon? Have you ever had them interfere in your daily life? I mean, nothing against... I love the men and women of Al-Anon. If you're in here, I'm your biggest supporter. But God, do you make people need to drink? <laughs> you know? God, my mother? But what's the problem with that? I can't deal with my mother. She's driving me crazy. I'm going to have one drink. Boom. Physical allergy. The next time you're talking to a newcomer, somebody gave me this advice a long time ago. Newcomers love to talk about their drinking escapades. They love it. Talk about the second drink. Everything other than that is irrelevant. It's all irrelevant. Why did they have a second drink? That's what to focus on when it comes to the first step. And thank God for the great Dr. Silkworth pointing this out to us. So if you're new, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I do want to say to the state line committee, how great it is to be back amongst everybody here at Stateline and back amongst in-person Alcoholics Anonymous and back among the Fellowship of the Spirit and back among people who are passionate about Alcoholics Anonymous and back among people who, if you weren't here this morning, I said it this morning, uh, the rest of AA is celebrating that us 1,200 are here. They love this weekend every year. They can't wait for all 1,200 of us to come here so they don't have to listen to us anymore. Um, and our passionate Alcoholics Anonymous routine. Um, my dad died in 2001. My dad died because he didn't have the Me Too moment. I'm not blaming anyone that he didn't. I'm just telling you. If someone has told you that it's impossible to drink yourself to death, it's entirely possible to drink yourself to death. That we're here to prevent tragedies from happening by getting to the Me Too moment and allowing people to realize that they're just like Fred and Jim. They're a jaywalker. And we know what jaywalkers do. They walk out in the middle of traffic. They walk out in the middle of traffic thinking they're not going to get hit by a car again. For today, I'm going to try to stay out of traffic. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.